when you're prime minister, you think you're the god, and you tell him what you're doing, and you say thank you for agreeing with me. <laughs> um, but no, I mean, I think that uh, I still don't fully understand why Blair went along with the United States, and I still don't fully understand. You know, I was writing articles in the paper saying Afghanistan. Have they read what happened to the British in 1842? And then I was writing about Iraq before the Iraq invasion. Hang on a second. They want to bring democracy to Iraq? Yeah. Haven't they read about, you know, 1920? And I was mocked, very much so. I mean, a lot of my colleagues made fun of me. I'm fine, you know. <laughs> um, the greatest sin I committed was to get it right. <laughs> yeah, of course. Even worse than predicting it was to get it right afterwards. And I wish I hadn't got it right. You know, I, I wrote on the day the Americans entered Baghdad, my story ended with the words, the invasion is now complete, and now the real story, the story of Iraq's resistance against the American occupation begins. And I was mocked on the BBC television that night. After the article was printed, it's there. And the only thing that surprised me was how quickly the insurgency started, how fast it went. I mean, I thought maybe by five, six months we'd see some attacks on the Americans. But there was a woman, a suicide, you know, before the war ended, before the invasion ended. And then, you know, within a month there were explosions beside the road, killing soldiers on vehicles. You know? Amazing. So, um, do you think uh, something will ch change if Obama was... Uh, no, being elected. it won't no. make the slightest bit of difference. No, absolutely why, why not. Why? We're always, always in the Middle East. Poor old Arabs. You know, oh, we can have. Maybe it'll be a Democrat. Maybe it'll be Carter. Maybe it'll be Clinton. This will be better. Yeah. It doesn't make any difference. At the end of the day, as long as America remains unconditionally committed to Israel and continues to pump billions of dollars, both in cash and in weapons, to Israel maintaining a strategic superiority over all the other people of the region as long as it claims that Israel's security is paramount, not Israel and the Arab security. After all, there are two groups of people out there. There will be no difference at all. And, you know, OK, Obama went to the Middle East and he went, what, 45 minutes with the Palestinians, 24 hours with the Israelis. Maybe he wants to be elected to the Israeli Knesset, as I said on television at the time. Um, and then they say, oh, well, you know, it doesn't really mean anything. He needs the votes. But afterwards, you know, Obama... But I've been through this before. Afterwards, there'll be some war in the Middle East, and the American president will call upon both sides to exercise restraint, and it will go on pumping weapons into Israel. And Israel, well, it might not win. It didn't win against the Hezbollah. I'm not sure the Hezbollah won. But, um, but it will be maintained as a potentially aggressive force with all these nuclear weapons. And then it'll be time for the midterm elections. And whoever is the president will be back to Jerusalem, giving 24 hours there and 45 minutes to Palestinians, and promising there'll be peace this year or a Palestinian state by next year or the year after next. And so it will go on. As long as we do not treat the people of the Middle East equally, and as long as we keep our armies in other people's countries which do not belong to us, it is not our right to be there, then conflict, pain, suffering, betrayal, tragedy and invasion will continue. You are working very hard on that. You are publishing many stories about this. So what do you think, what should we all journalists all around the world do? Challenge power. Challenge power. Challenge power. <clears throat> to quote the great Israeli journalist Amir Haas, monitor the centers of power. Challenge generals, challenge presidents, challenge prime ministers, challenge journalists, other journalists, the journalists who think that they write for Newsweek and the New York Times and they tell us what to think. Who are these people? They work with governments. They nuzzle up against governments. They like to feel the warmth of the fur of the Secretary of State or the, or the, or the Department of Defense or the President or the White House. They like the White House lawn. It's beautiful. Yeah, hypocrite. And they have this parasitic, osmotic relationship with power. They think sources are sources within power. And um, they betray us. They betray us all. So um, so great. Uh, we should all be like you. Uh, no, I don't think so. Then I wouldn't, <laughs> I then I wouldn't so. have a job, would I? Uh, also, one more question, very important. Yeah. Uh, many uh, journalists died during war. You know, Bosnian war. Bo Bos um, in many words. Mm. What every journalist must know if he he going to war, mm. how he, he, he must behave. Look. You are the, the great... Pre you know, no, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not, a, I'm not a seer on this. You know, I'm, I'm still a street reporter. I still go out reporting in Beirut and so on. I'm not sitting in Washington in a think tank. Yeah? Look, th that's uh, what I'm saying. Okay, you're, you're asking me the question for that reason. Look, I think there's two things. First of all, wherever you go, respect the people. Even if they have criminal leaders, respect the people. They are human beings. As the Imam Ali said, he was a Shiite, of course. 
if you see another man, he's either your brother in religion or your brother in humanity. Well, I'm not religious, so it's got to be humanity. Mm -hmm. But respect the people you're among, whether they be the Lebanese, Muslims or Christians, Serbs, Bosnian Muslims, Bosnian Serbs, Croatians, we know all the differences. And the second thing is, if you're going to go to a war, remember you're going to report you're not going to die. Otherwise you won't go or you will die.